Once again, if you have taken any photos or any boomerang, any selfies with your friends, do upload and then share on your stories and don't forget to hashtag YEF2022. All right, from the queue or the crowd that we have outside, I believe that maybe some of them that didn't manage to get enough yeah, food for the lunch, uh, sorry, the tea break or the coffee break. But never mind, we can look forward for the lunch. Yeah, we have an hour break for lunch later. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's proceed yeah, to our next part of this uh, forum, which is on sustainability. When we talk about sustainability, we have rely on oil and gases for decades but consequently the rise of carbon emission has impacted our environment and of course driven climate change and it is no longer a luxury but a necessity to explore clean and renewable energy in the near future as simple as it may sound there are actually many concerns that arise with energy reformation so you may ask yourself certain questions. How are we going to protect the workers who are now working in the industry? How are we going to address energy poverty? And how we as the general public can participate in the sustainability agenda? All these questions still remain unanswered. So here at Youth Economic Forum 2022, today, we would like to present to you Driving People-Centered Energy Transition with our Sustainability Agenda. Let us welcome our speakers, Ms. Amira Burkis, Associate of Energy Modeling and Policy Planning from ASEAN Center of Energy. And we have Mr. Wan Sayuti Wan Husin, Head of Strategy and Policy in Corporate Sustainability Patronas. Ms. Ilham Fadela Sunhaji, Head of Corporate Strategy of Malaysia Petroleum Resource Corporation. And we have Mr. Dinagaran Chandra, Assistant Vice President for Busa Malaysia. And also our moderator for the session, Ms. Yoram Samar Bay, Southeast Asia Regional Commercial Head of Bloomberg and yes. Good morning everyone, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining our sustainability session. This is a really important topic and we are very thrilled to share our experience and opinions with you. My name is Summer Bay uh, from Bloomberg NEF, the research company focusing on decarbonization and climate change. So before we kick off the, today's panel discussion uh, with my wonderful panelists here, um, I will just set up uh, the stage a little bit of context for our, our discussion today. So since last COP26, uh, there were a lot of countries uh, pledge carbon neutrality. And there are zillions of companies actually promise for the net zero target uh, by 2050. It was great push and momentum in the market, I would say. And everyone here probably understand that as well. Um, and um, we were very excited about this, all this momentum and uh, everyone's attention. But in fact, and also in fact, and $755 billion uh, has been invested in low carbon technology and infrastructure last year, right? Only last year. That's basically double the number compared to 2015, which is the Paris Agreement actually adapted, right? That's a great number. Although, according to my colleagues, um, it, the world would need $175 trillion of investment to achieve net zero target in, in low carbon technology and infrastructure, right? We, that means that basically at least, you know, two trillion dollars uh, of the investment needs to happen annual basis from now on, right? Until 2050. That's a lot of work. That's like basically three times of the investment figure compared to last year. And we are hearing a lot of many asset owners and then, you know, the financial institutions are claiming that they will not uh, you know, invest in fossil fuel, um, they'll talk, uh, focus on low, ca low carbon technology. But how are we going to do this, right? Economy is still 
from the fossil fuel industry, and oil and gas com companies and industries are very important for our economy. So this is, we are in a really difficult stage, and next level of game, <laughs> right? Asking how question. So today, um, you know, we are very, very, um, you know, fortunate to have a mixture of the private and, and, and you know, public sectors um, here. And then we'll hear, hear about these how questions from them, yep. and how are we trying to achieve this decarbonization. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. So let's start with, uh, I wanted to start this discussion um, with plans first. Um, so Ilham, let's start from you. Um, would you please remind the audience what is the Malaysia government's plan um, and, and to forward the low carbon economy? Right, thank you so much, Summer, for the question. Um, right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ilham, uh, the head of corporate strategy for Malaysia Petroleum Resources Corporation. Okay, whatever disclaimer, whatever I say here uh, represent my personal point of view. I, I don't, I do not represent the government or my organisation, but more is more on sharing my experience with regards to energy. Right. So the government recently unveiled the Dasar. Tenaga Nasional or the National Energy Policy um, with a vision to have the energy sustainability towards achieving um, shared prosperity. There are four strategic trusts. First of all, looking into optimizing energy resources to stimulate economic growth. And then number two would be stimulate growth, market opportunities and uh, cost advantage for the economy and the people. And thirdly, which is very, very important, which is enhancing energy sector contributions towards environmental sustainability. And uh, of course, ensure energy security towards fiscal sustainability. So all this information, you can actually look into EPU website and, and, and download more of this information. So if we, if we look into the strategic trust tree, which is enhancing energy sector contribution towards environmental sustainability, um, the, the strategy is to promote um, the use of clean fuel in industries and determine the greenhouse gas emission reduction in core sector. Um, the other strategy is to encourage business to implement carbon um, footprint accounting. My colleague here will explain more about the carbon footprint um, uh, accounting or like the carbon trading uh, system. Uh, the other portion is reporting and certification uh, as well as more access to renewable energy. So all this low carbon uh, aspiration is already defined in the RMK 12, 13, 14, and 15. RMK 12 talks about ensuring that you have a lot of, um, how do you say, excess, uh, of, excess of coverage um, of the rural areas around 99%, improving um, the Sabah power supply reliability and enhancing fuel standards. So this is RMK 12 focus more on the fundamentals. And then if you go to RMK 13, it's more on ensuring energy security. So for example, looking into en um, the, the, in a way, the gas market liberalization, having um, the right RTT infrastructure for uh, the secure supply of gas. And uh, RMK 14 and 15 are very much, uh, very, very interesting. We're talking more about focusing on the EV ecosystem, uh, having energy storage, uh, hydrogen hub in Sarawak and enhancing biofuel in marine and aviation sectors. So very, very exciting uh, plans in the future. So all this to manage the energy trilemma. So obviously making sure that the energy is affordable, uh, yet at the same time uh, making sure that it's secure and uh, it's also preserving the environment. So from this, from all these plans, the target is to increase 1 to 1.5% 1 added GDP uh, to total about 260 billion and the creation of 207,000 jobs in the green sector, in the green economy sector. So all in all, if I may say that uh, the, carbon the low carbon aspiration, um, there's this aim towards uh, commitment of no more coal power plant, uh, increase RE shares in the, in the environment, there are a lot of targets, again, check out the EPU's uh, website to find more about the targets. Um, the plan is to have uh, EVs, to expand EVs from less than 1% to 38% by 2040, uh, an increase of public transport model share from 20 to 50%. So that's a bit of the snapshot. If I, will go, if I were to go through the detail, it will be like half an hour. 
So over to you, uh, Miss Summer. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. There was a very a lot of like initiative going on in, in the Malaysia government side. Um, and speaking of your opinion, um, do you think well, we know that COP twenty seven is coming? Do you think Malaysia will announce any grand policy oversight all these uh, I initiative that you share with us? I think um, the best person to answer that question will be Miss. Mr. Sayuti, who will be attending the COP27. So <laughs> I will pass the question to Mr. Sayuti. Sure, sure. So Anjali, maybe we should start from Petrona's side, the short-term and also long-term plan for the energy transitions, and then a little bit of snapshot about COP27, as you have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. Thank you, Ihan, for passing that <laughs> first question to me. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Uh, Wan Sayuti, I'm the uh, head of strategy and policy in Petronas Corporate Sustainability. So perhaps before I go to the plan, uh, I just want to reflect the feedback by Inger Anderson, the Executive Director of United Nations Environment Program. So she said that the world today uh, is facing three types of crises. You guys know the three crises? The first one is the climate change, right? The climate crisis. Uh, the second one is the nature loss, nature and biodiversity loss, another crisis. And the third crisis is rising inequality. So in addressing energy transition, uh, it's not just about switching from hydrocarbon to uh, renewable sources, right? How do we make sure that we take into account all these different elements to make sure that we are progressing toward a just and equitable transition, especially in a developing economy like Malaysia, you know, um, uh, as an NOC like Petronas, we shoulder a broader responsibility than just the commercial pursuit. Uh, so there's a broader ecosystem that with Petronas, I would say the vendors and suppliers, uh, you know, we have about 4,000 plus. How do we make sure that in this journey towards net zero, Petronas announced net zero in November 2020, our aspiration, and now working towards translating that into actions. How do we make sure the 4,000 plus vendors and suppliers are also with us? They have the literacy level uh, on energy transition, you know, at a common understanding to drive this forward together, right? So, um, and on nature, how do we leverage? Malaysia is one of the mega diverse country in the world. We only, as a landmass, we only 0.2% of total world but we are one of the 17th most, most mega diverse country. So there are a lot of opportunities on nature-based climate solutions. We talk about terrestrial forests, and we also talk about the blue carbon at the coastal area, right? But there's also fact that Malaysia is losing about 0.37% of forests every year for economic development and so on, right? So that's the nature aspect. And then there comes the social aspect. How do we make sure that we prepare the next generations of leaders, you guys, you know, to carry this, uh, you know, a more just and equitable transition forward? So for Petronas, we have set a target in the midterm um, to cap our emission by 2024 at 49.5 million tonne of CO2 equivalent. I think that has been published. To cap an emission for oil and gas companies that are still growing and also a big contributor to the you know, Malaysian economy, that, that's a big statement. Because that's saying that we want to decouple our production and emission. So there must be an innovative and technology solution that has to come with it. So how do we unlock the light of CCS, carbon capture and storage, you know, uh, DAC, direct air capture, and also nature-based solution, right? And we also, in uh, our midterm targets, we put a plan to grow our renewable energy capacity. So Petronas is going big into solar. Uh, in fact, in quarter two this year, we launched Gentari. It's a new entity uh, under Petronas, uh, Generasi Lestari. So under Gentari, the objective is to accelerate the deployment of clean energy solutions. So there are three verticals under Gentari. One is solar. And second is hydrogen, and the third one is green mobility. So all of this is trying to, I guess, unlock and accelerate the deployment and also opportunities in Malaysia and also for the region, right? So that's number two. Number three, uh, our midterm 
targets is also on social. We also want to make sure that we, um, you know, the education beneficiaries of Malaysian talent, the young ones, through scholarship, through technical training programs. So we target 24,000 um, uh, beneficiaries in the five years time period. So that is a, a short term. And, and in the longer term, of course, this is a foundation to get to um, net zero by 2050, right? So um, soon, I think uh, by, by COP27, you will hear more about the plan, what will be the targets in the mid-term 2030 to make sure that we are aligned with uh, Malaysia's plan, as Ilham mentioned, the DASA Tenaga Negara, and also the uh, Global Meeting Pledge uh, 2030 that Malaysia is part of. Um, I think that number is still, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, soon you will hear. Yeah, uh, a bit on COP27. Okay, COP27 um, in Egypt, Sham al Sheikh, and COP28 uh, will be in Abu Dhabi. So these two COP, actually people saying that it's Asia or African COP. I think it focused more on the developing economy story. But the, um, I think the assignment is one is this global stock take. People talk about since Paris 2015 or COP21, what has happened? I think many countries have pledged a more ambitious or revised their NDC, right? The nationally determined contribution. Even for Malaysia, last year we revised uh, from 30% carbon intensity against GDP to 45%. But if you're to combine all the NDCs of countries, this is the unofficial report from UNCC last year at COP26. They're saying, actually, if you're to combine, the global emission still increase, not on the downward trend yet. You know, in fact, in COP26, they say 14% increase. So, and at Glasgow, um, we are on the trajectory towards 2.4 degree C world by 2050. So it's still far off from the 1.5 or 2 degree C uh, as Paris Agreement has set up. So that's, that's one of the key focus. Global stock take and assign accountability to countries and companies that have pledged uh, towards certain actions. Summer. Very looking forward to hear your COP27. That's basically week or so, right? So eight days, nine days. It'll be like a very exciting uh, announcement from Petronas, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's completely, I think, I completely agree. Uh, the COP26, we are still, um, we, everyone has have uh, awakened by the cold water, you know, by IPCC reports, and then there was a lot of uh, realization that we have to do action, and then this th that is why the, a lot of companies and countries are gathered together. You know, I, I wanted to, go to come to you after you heard from the Malaysia's initiative and also the Petronas, uh, you know, aspiration of net zero, and also new, probably new information. Um, what is uh, the ESG uh, initiative, and also maybe the regulatory advice that that first Malaysia is actually implementing? We wanted to understand from you. Thanks, Samu, for the question. As I was driving here this morning, I also had a sudden realization that I'm no longer a youth, a young professional. So it's very encouraging to see a lot of young professionals here today to learn about sustainability and what are the issues that affect the world today. And for Bursa Malaysia, sustainability and ESG is a big, big focus area for us as the National Stock Exchange. It's very much ingrained in our core belief system and since 2015, all listed issuers that are listed on Bursa Malaysia are required to disclose how they manage sustainability issues. And that can be done whether in a standalone sustainability report, and I'm sure you've seen companies producing like 100 pages of sustainability reports, and Petronas has a very comprehensive report. Or they can also do in a form of a sustainability statement that is within an annual report. So through this disclosure, we hope companies are also building in the right set of policies, processes that will enable them to have a high quality disclosure. And there are many investors and stakeholder groups also scrutinizing the level of disclosures made by the company on sustainability. And very recently, in September this year, we have enhanced the sustainability reporting requirement for listed issuers. So moving forward, all companies will need to disclose common sustainability indicators that cut across all industries and sectors 
and also moving forward, companies will need to disclose how they manage climate-related risk and opportunities. And we feel this is very much in line with the growing investor expectation for decision useful and comparable sustainability information. So that's one way on how we are moving the ecosystem forward on the ESG front. Another way is we are a strong believer of ESG education. So we have various advocacy sessions for our listed issuers, basically to learn about what is ESG, how does that impact my business model, learning about carbon footprinting, not many companies also know how to measure carbon footprint and what is typically done is companies look at their carbon emissions from their direct operations so that's about fuel consumption so if you're a company with a fleet of vehicles you need to take into account what will be the carbon emission from your trucks and you need to take into account how much carbon emissions are you putting into the atmosphere from your purchase electricity and i'm sure you heard about scope 3 scope 3 is about value chain emissions it's about what are the emissions that arise from your suppliers? What are the emissions that arise from employee travel to work? And even home working has emissions. So it's important for companies to be holistic in how they calculate carbon emissions across their operations and value chain. So moving forward, carbon reporting is going to be absolutely key. And we organize various advocacy sessions to help companies to go through that journey. Another important aspect that Bursa Malaysia is also a listed issuer. We are also a commercial entity with responsibility. And we recognize that we have the ability to influence the wider ecosystem by walking the talk. So we have our own sustainability roadmap, sustainability policies and governance structure. And we try to walk the talk by demonstrating that we have robust policies and also disclosures. Uh, for instance, we have announced that we want to become carbon neutral by the end of this year and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And that 2050 commitment is also similar to Malaysia's own country aspiration. And this is one way we hope to also influence other companies to follow suit. Last but not the least, to support the country's uh, decarbonization efforts, we are developing a voluntary carbon market trading platform that would basically enable companies to trade high quality carbon credits. We believe as we approach a net zero future, carbon markets will play a super critical role in scaling up financing towards climate friendly projects and solutions that will become important in the future. So this includes helping uh, to support financing for projects like reforestation, nature based solutions, methane capture and storage, carbon capture and storage, uh, deployment of EV charging systems. These solutions are very expensive to deploy at scale. So it's important that we facilitate more financing. So that drives R&D innovation to ensure these technologies become feasible to implement. And these are just uh, several ways that Bursa Malaysia is trying to drive the ESG ecosystem forward. Miss Summer, if I may, I would like to add a bit to what um, Bursa is um, sharing with regards to um, sustainability practices. So the good part about PLCs, our PLCs, they have Bursa to guide them in terms of adopting sustainability practices. But for SMEs, right, SMEs, um, there are no specific regulatory body governing SMEs. So for us in MPRC, uh, we are looking, um, we are overlooking uh, or sort of advocating sustainability amongst our SMEs. Mr. Sayuti just now mentioned about the 4,000 online gas services and equipment companies. So we are actually um, supporting the sustainability agenda by making sure all our 4,000 plus OGSE companies are on board. So we are also launching the sustainability plan, in fact, by November 15 this year. And next year, we are also launching the roadmap. So eventually, you know, by the end of the day, we are all, you know, Kuarga Malaysia. We don't want to leave anyone behind. So together, we embark on this journey. So that's um, my contribution for my, my, my part. Yeah. Yes, you need to everyone, uh, you need, we need all everyone's contribution for this journey, yeah, for sure. So it's really great to hear that like, in the person Malaysia's initiative. Is, I think I, I totally agree. And it's the financial is really important. Um, so we have to have a make ecosystem that just like to be easier to invest and then how understand how important this is for everyone. And thank you, thank you, Ilhan, to, to, to contribute that on this as well. Uh, so Amira. Just step outside a little bit. The reason we are talking all of these climate change, most core reason is emissions. Everyone's talking about emissions these days, right? And that emission is created by energy system. 
<laughs> what, what are we doing wrong <laughs> in ASEAN energy system? And what do we need to do better? Okay, so thank you so much, um, everyone. Probably when uh, Mr. Dina mentions that, oh, he's actually kind of like looking back, whether you are young or not, at least um, I could actually say that I'm still Gen Z. <laughs> so I could actually relate to you guys as well. So probably, hopefully, this can actually um, um, balance um, the panel. But for me, I think, um, um, I'm, I'm working for ASEAN Center for Energy. Basically, we are intergovernmental bodies that support ASEAN member states' um, ambitions in the energy sector. And then by looking how ASEAN is actually working on is that right now we have the ASEAN plan um, of action for energy cooperation basically setting a three targets. The first one is renewable share and installed capacity. And then we have targets, uh, which is, it was um, installed capacity 35%. And then renewable share in total primary energy supply, which is 23%. And then energy intensity reductions. Um, so energy intensities um, until 23% uh, as well. And then um, we do our report, basically. Last month, we published the seven ASEAN Energy Outlook. So we do, we model, we project, we see until 2025, until 2050, how can we actually improve more? So there are uh, four scenarios actually uh, entails in that report. First one is business uh, or baseline scenario, which is um, probably similar to business as usual. And then we have the ASEAN member states um, policies, current policy right now. And then we also have the ASEAN uh, plan of action, so regional target I mentioned before. And then last but not least is the least cost optimization. So right now we are trying to find ASEAN is a developing country, meaning investment is required a lot. He, she mentions, uh, Summer mentions like a thousand uh, billions or even like one trillion more. So right now we project that we need investment, 726 billion in just three decades only for power. That's a lot of money. And then uh, besides that investment, we also see that this list cost options uh, on the scenario, the last scenario, uh, we could have at least a least cost option that we could actually pursue. That entails diversifications of energy portfolio. So when we are talking about energy transitions, as mentioned by Ms. Ilham, energy trilemma, we need to balance that. We need to balance the affordability of energy. We need to check whether it's sustainability and whether it's actually reliable at this moment. It's very fragile. It's not just like switching from the oil and gas infrastructures into renewable sources, because renewables, again, have intermittency issues. We have need to have a lot of interconnection. We need a lot of battery storage. And at the same time, we also need to sink that carbon that is, exists right now in order to achieve the, the ambitions of goal of net zero or carbon neutrality. So looking at that, we have a lot of like um, discussions at the ASEAN Center for Energy, and we see that as a, a potential opportunities as well, that during this transitional plan, we need to be holistic, First, by doing diversification, so we need to not only talking about renewable sources at the very forefront, but also other supporting infrastructures, technologies as well, investment as well, the people as well. Um, we actually talks about even um, the job creations that we see. We we forest forecasted, we projected that by 2050 we would have 5.5 million jobs only from renewable, not only uh, for um, supporting infrastructures in the ASEAN region. So uh, probably to link um, to what is actually mentioned for markets. So we, there is actually a saying that I heard um, during the UN discussions. They made urgent transformations for all sectors. So we need to think that energy sector is not only power generation, solar electricity that we use on daily life, but also uh, we need to transform our elect, uh, elect, um, the transportations, industries as well, agricultures as well. So many things um, that we need to do. And um, for me, I think there are two things that could, should be at the forefront of our um, solutions 
for ASEAN, or even like in the case of Malaysia right now, first is that the cheapest energy or even um, the least emission for us to do that is by not using it. So energy efficiency, energy intensity, what does it entail? It's actually you need to be aware of what is actually uh, the electricity or energy that you use. Um, there is a fuel economy as well. And then the second is diversification, as I mentioned before. And this um, ASEAN Energy Outlook actually see, saw some potential for Malaysia as well, that we forecasted there will be an interconnections that is needed in order to tone down and balance the, the flu high fluctuations of renewables by connecting all of the ASEAN, center, uh, ASEAN um, region together. And then by that collaboration. Regional collaboration. Yes, multilateral power trade, and we, we name it ASEAN Power Grid. So if you if you can actually mention, and then there are three um, new interconnection that is being planned right now. So it's actually an opportunity as well for the Malaysia. First, there there will be uh, we propose to have a Thailand and Peninsular Malaysia to be connected, and then Peninsular Malaysia to Sumatra, Indonesia, and then we also uh, propose to have the Sarawak and then Brunei Darussalam connections together so that it can actually make uh, an, an energy security is there and by deploying a multilateral power trade in renewable, it can actually, you know, and then the investment is there. A lot of people would actually talk about it. So I think it's a great opportunity uh, and at the same time, uh, a great challenge as well <laughs> for the region or even Malaysia. Uh, but now we, we probably need to look at how opportunities are rising right. from this. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mira. That's a very interesting point. But I want to stay with you, and then I want to actually explore, elaborate a little bit more about job security part, because um, the, the industry is facing two different uh, the workforces now: the veterans who build their career really long time in the oil and gas industry, and also the new um, young professionals like yourself who are wanting to work from sustainability. Right. So we have a very different two um, two groups uh, in in our career um, you know market now. Um, and then, well, so, and I realized that when I was talking to, I'm no, no longer young anymore, so <laughs> when I'm talking to our young professionals, I realized that their uh, focus is very, very different. So I want to actually ask this question to Amira. Mm -hmm. Amira, yes. you're the youngest panelist <laughs> <laughs> that we have here. Thank you. Um, and then what is important for as a new um, young professionals like yourself when you're looking into the next career? What would be important factor for you? Okay, so at least for me, there are four things. First is that I'm making a big impact. So there is actually a study conducted um, globally that the Gen Z, I, I'm, I'm sure that everyone is Gen Z right now, um, probably, or millennials, <laughs> or even younger, or if, if there is anyone uh, who bored um, after um, our Gen Z, but there is a shift, a big shift, for our uh, workforce trends. Right now people think that, oh, oil and gas is such a, I'm sorry, <laughs> but there are a lot of like discussions like, oh, this is a dirty work, we want to work with sustainability one, right? I'm sure that everyone actually thinks that how can actually we, we work with a big impact? You actually contributing to the society, you are encouraging them. That's actually the first thing that we think when we want to work at, at several companies. And then second is that they value the skills development. Right now we, we want to work, but we need some space as well that we want to develop so that we can contribute more to the companies or some institutions that you work on. So there are two things that definitely ha um, have um, something. Uh, that need to be highlighted, and then future proof. You know, because energy transitions is not going to be like only a trend for five to ten years. Even, I mean, working from coal transitions or oil transitions to coal and then base several um, oil res um, resources before, it takes decades. It takes 50, 70, years to do that, so it's future proof. And then last but not least is that we need to have women 
in the industries that we want to have on, you know. So I'm encouraging all of the young um, women, if you want to actually think about what kind of sectors that you would like to do it, let's jump into energy sector because we need more women there, we need more representations, and we need to have a lot of us to be part of that transitional plan. That's very inspiring, isn't it? <laughs> um, really, I'm, I, I'm very, like, uh, really, um, what can I say, moved by your statement, actually. Um, I totally agree, and uh, we need more women in the industry. Um, and also learning, you know, like I said, you mentioned about learning pro components, and that's kind of what we all, actually, in all of our panelists even try to do it every day um, in, in our long career. <laughs> so Dina, let me, let's, uh, let's go, go to you. You have a very uh, interesting background. You have an engineer background, and you come to all the way here to Bursa, Malaysia. Um, uh, just uh, sh how important is it have a really status continuously capacity building in your uh, sustainable professionals, as a young pro sustainable professional? I think first and foremost, I'm so glad we're part of a gender equal panel here, so that's good. <laughs> I, I think for any professional, it's important to have a continuous learning mindset. We now live in a hyper-connected world and constantly bombarded with new information. Compliance environment is changing fast. Technology is changing fast. So be it ESG or not, any professional need to make sure they learn new things as fast as possible. On the ESG front, uh, professionals like me also need to learn across so many different types of thematic or topical issues. That includes climate change, human rights, labor practices, corporate governance, and that's just to name a few. And there's this entire alphabet soup of different types of acronyms and terms used in the sustainability sphere, TCFD, GRI, net zero, carbon neutrality, and what that means. So there's a lot of learning and navigating around the complexities. Take net zero, for instance. It's not just about buying carbon offsets and you're claiming that you're net zero because you've neutralized your emissions. Net zero, Although about carbon offsets, I'm so glad that you're offsetting the events emissions, and that's a very encouraging step towards climate action. And I hope one Sayuti, during your travel to Egypt, you also buy some carbon offsets to neutralize your emissions. For us to achieve net zero, it's about decarbonization as well. It's not just about carbon offsets. And if you look at what is widely accepted as a credible pathway towards net zero, we need to halve our emissions, cut down by 50% by 2030, and we need to cut down emissions by 90 to 95 percent, potentially by 2050. And that is a very aggressive decarbonization pathway. And the use of offsets is to basically to neutralize hard to abate emissions. This means for all companies, regardless of industry and sector, it's important that you also think about what are the measures that you should put in place to cut down your operational and value chain emissions. So it's important for a sustainability professional to keep an open mind and learn new things. And each topical and thematic issue that I just mentioned has its own structured way of learning, and they all evolve at different rate. So it's important for you to also recognize your own biases. Although ESG is a very specialized discipline, I've also seen many instances of professionals coming from different industry backgrounds. I've seen accountants evolving to become a sustainability or ESG professional because they are able to connect ESG issues with the financial aspects. I've seen engineers becoming very competent ESG professional because they understand the complexities around climate science and also the deployment of low carbon technologies. I've seen lawyers becoming very adept ESG professional because they understand the nuances, the intricacies of human rights issues, ESG compliance issues. And this is just to name a few types of professionals out there. Uh, in collaboration with UN Global Compact Malaysia and Brunei, we have also developed a corporate sustainability practitioner competency framework, basically to demystify what does an ESG professional do at work. Uh, the competency framework basically outlines what are the core competencies expected from a sustainability professional, and so what are the areas that he or she should be developing competencies around. So it is published on Bursa Sustain. Uh, Bursa Sustain is basically our free online learning microsite, purely dedicated on sustainability and responsible investment. 
So if there are any sustainability professionals out there, or if you're interested to become one, I do encourage you to visit uh, Busa Sustain. It's free, and feel free to navigate the website and learn as much as possible. Thank you, Dina. One um, I want to come back to you. Uh, Dina mentioned that there's a public, publicly available website, and we've talked about war of talent earlier, right? And then Patronus must be dealing with that right now. And I heard there's generation one, generation two uh, working in Patronus now. How are you, what are the tangible initiatives that Patronus is dealing with to this actually co-host and then actually connecting to the veterans and the new young professionals in the organization? Thank you, thank you, Samuel. Um, I think maybe I start back and uh, in 2019, uh, Petronas uh, declared this uh, our purpose. I mean, previously, uh, Petronas since 1974 until 2018, we have this vision like the leading oil and gas multinational choice. I think we recognize uh, the energy transition, uh, the need to you know, decarbonize and also move towards a low carbon economy, right? So one of the very first thing that we did was I would change our purpose from vision to purpose. So now, if you read in the reports, in the news, it's a progressive energy and solutions partner, enriching life for a sustainable future. So it's not a mere statement of purpose, but it also signifies our move to a broader energy spectrum. It's no longer just oil and gas, but it's also going into the space of, I mentioned Jantari, right? And how do we develop the renewable solar, accelerate that in Malaysia and also um, other parts of the world. Also the hydrogen economy, we make it big in Malaysia, in ASEAN as well. So that, that's the very first thing that we did. And, and um, that also, um, in a way, uh, balancing between the needs for the, you know, um, I wouldn't say old, but in a season, practitioners in oil and gas, but also the newcomers that go into a broader spectrum of energy needs, right? So if I ask, uh, Petronas have 46,000 workforce now, uh, globally. Um, how many are below 35, do you think? We're a very young organization. How many? Any numbers? 10,000? 60% is below 35. 60% of 46,000, right? So I'm, I'm not qualified anymore. But <laughs> so one of the big initiative is actually the Young Professional Club. We have this big organization uh, amongst the young, below 35, Young Professional Club. Um, you know, you have to be elected. They have you know, elections and so on to be part of that uh, executive uh, committee of the YPC. But it's not merely just a club because the YPC is also given access to the critical council in the organization. For example, the one I'm uh, part of is Sustainability Council. So Sustainability Council is chaired by the Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer. So we do have rep from the YPC to be part of that as well. So, you know, to be part of the conversation. So we want diversity, not just, you know, multiple functional areas, but we also want diversity for ideas, you know, cross generation as well. So we bring and elevate that importance. And the YPC advisor or patron is one of the, what we call ELT, executive leadership team, like the very top management of Petronas. So they have a direct access to really tap the ideas and translate that into actions. That's one. Number two, um, we um, encourage um, innovation in the company. So we have several avenue or innovation platform. Recently, we launched what we call Ping, Patronas Innovation Garage. So that's exactly like an incubation hub uh, for the staff uh, that have this entrepreneurship kind of uh, talent that have ideas, but maybe I'm not in innovation team, I'm in finance or I'm in sales and marketing, but I have these ideas because I see the gaps. So our hypothesis, we, we say that we know that staff, young staff especially, that working in specific segment or function, they do see gaps in day to day, right? But how do they channel the idea for solution? So this platform, you can be anywhere, any one in organization, you know, register your ideas. So we have this kind of like a shark uh, tank moment, right? You will pitch your ideas and 
if it's move on to the next stage, you will go through the incubation uh, hub. And then you will be given uh, resources and team uh, to work with you. And also, uh, if you select it to the next stage, you are also, uh, Petronas will also give you seed money to invest. So that kind of mm. activities to promote young ones to come out uh, and be part of that solution. That's, that's very encouraging because the company is actually supporting their innovations uh, internally and also externally. So that's, that's, that's great. I, I believe that that innovation business ideas can maybe be the like, separate business in the future. Yeah, right? exactly. So, okay, yeah. so that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so Ilhan, I wanted to come back um, to you on this um, government's role. Um, I'm a little bit conscious of time, so we'll do a little bit quickly. Um, what do you think, in personal view, what you heard this from Amira and then Dina and also the one charity about what we are doing in the cooperation wars? What do you think as a, a, a what do you think government can do, or in personal view, <laughs> the government can do better and then facilitate all this ecosystem of, of job security and also um, you know the removing the fear of losing a job because of all these sustainability trends we are facing. Thanks, Summer, for the question. I have to qualify again uh, when I answer a question is um, from my perspective. But um, I will answer this question from the perspective of Malaysia Petroleum Resources Corporation. So obviously, we are um, supporting the OGSA sector, online gas services and equipment sector. So um, what we're doing is to figure out you know, ways to ensure that the talent is being retained in, in this space. Online gas industries, are still relevant, are still relevant for the next um, 50 years. So with all the sustainability agenda coming to the picture, yes, sustainability is in place, renewable energy is expected to be 50% of the power mix by 2050, is by 2050, not now. So definitely oil and gas um, talent are critical right now um, in the next 10, 20 years. So what we're doing in MPRC is that we have this national OGSE industry blueprint 2021-2030 so our aim is to develop this robust, um, resilient, highly competitive industry that can compete at the international market. So we have, as usual, we have a blueprint, we have a house, we have 31 initiatives um, covering six levers, technology, talent, industry. Um, for the talent aspect, we are looking into ways to make sure that there are more talent in the oil and gas space. So recently what we did is we have this national OGSE pavilion. So we are in a way um, promoting the jobs in the OGSE sector. So we promoted 600 jobs in the OGSE sector. And within two months after that, 50 um, personnel were recruited. So this is what we can do within our capacity as a government agency. So there are a lot more initiatives that we are doing to encourage more talent in this space. So I urge all of you, if you're interested into working in the oil and gas sector, uh, you can check out NPRC website and see you know, the latest happenings there. But obviously when you talk about the talent in the oil and gas uh, industry, in the future, the talent will be infused with element of sustainability. So it's very important for all of us here in this room to make sure that we improve our competency in terms of sustainability. Over to you, Ms. Summer. Perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so let's uh, switch our gear a little bit more um, to the gender equality and the social inclusion, because that's a topic that we all need to actually be aware. Um, so I've, I've mentioned this earlier. Um, me, myself, is attending a lot of conferences internationally. Um, and unfortunately, in energy conference, you still don't see many of diverse panelists. right? you have a tendency to see all male panels. <laughs> um, and that's quite known, like common things. Um, and um, it's, it's just disturbed me. Um, and I, I actually wanted to come to Amira. Amira, you mentioned about numbers earlier, uh, about gender equality in ASEAN. Can you share a little bit of that? Okay, so um, not in terms of numbers, I would say, but right now ASEAN um, Center for Energy, which we kind of like advocate this as well to the ASEAN member state, is that we want to have more uh, holistic transitional plant to have a gender inclusions there. So right now, um, we have uh, ASEAN right now have the ASEAN Renewable Energy Gender Roadmap. So we try to penetrate and incorporate genders there with 
um, several phases that needs to be done. So it can actually be adopted by, 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 by Malaysia government as well as private companies to see that, oh, this is how we do it. So basically right now, there are several challenges actually. First is that we don't have enough data for us to actually track how many stamp graduate um, female in the ASEAN region. And then even, even though we have so far, it's like very, very limited of them. So enabling environments is the key to have more women to actually come in. As I mentioned before, um, I'm trying to get into this sector because I know that there is less female actually here. So I'm trying to be in that part of the system and try to get that and see, okay, so we need to make a change. And how do we do it? Is that we want to have a lot of like ASEAN member states also come on board with us, trying to um, uh, walk the talk of the ASEAN um, gender mainstreaming framework, as well as the ASEAN renewable energy um, roadmap uh, in terms of gender. Thank you, thank you. And I think, Ilhan, you have uh, some numbers you, you wanted to share earlier. Yeah, so can you share a little bit of that? Right, right. Uh, talking about gender equality, um, it is quite unfortunate that uh, when you look into the gender equality level, Malaysia is actually the bottom in Southeast Asia in terms of gender equality. It's very embarrassing. So out of all this country, you have Myanmar, Cambodia, Brunei above us, and we are the number 128 out of 144. That's like really bad. And the, 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 the area that pushes us down is actually our representation in politics as, uh, uh, as well as low female participation rate. This is despite the fact that we are actually number one in the world, even beating US, in terms of access to education, secondary and tertiary. So we're number one, we're beating US, but yet, we are number 128, so that means we need more women uh, participating in politics, participating, uh, you know, like being professionals and so on. So I definitely, you know, uh, support your agenda to have more women in RE. Definitely, that's one of them. But moving forward, the question is, what do we do about that? What do we do about that? So for, for me, uh, personally, I'm also part of this Women Leadership Foundation. So um, the plan is to nurture and generate 2,500 female leaders for the next five years. And um, next year, we are actually planning to conduct this World Women Leadership Summit. We are inviting um, nine presidents, women presidents uh, in different countries to be part of this World Women Leadership Summit. For anyone here who's interested to volunteer and be part of this, please reach out to me. Because by the end of the day, you know, it's us. So for us, we have the responsibility to make sure that our ranking increase. So that's our plan moving forward, and we need to take action. Thank you. So one to you, hearing that for very inspiring these two female leaders. <laughs> um, and um, so I heard that you mentioned that the, the youth pool that you were going through the elections and that they're included in the, the executive board at meeting as well. Um, is there any uh, gender equality initiative that Petronas is planning? Are they doing the going through the election as well? I think before I answer that, uh, I think one number that I have, uh, if you refer to the Global Gender Gap Report 2022, uh, you know, recently uh, published, right? So it will take 132 years to close the gender gap if we are moving the pace that we're moving now, right? So that's, none of us will see that, right? So it must be done with intention. It must be a well-crafted design program to ensure the parity or the gap is closed. So in Petronas, I'm happy to say, um, this is anecdotal, right? But the, the chief financial officer, uh, CFOs, right? For the first time in 48 years of Petronas, it's a female, it's a woman, right? And then, <laughs> then you say, oh, it's finance. Many organizations have finance uh, women leaders. Uh, but the chief for Malaysian assets for upstream, right? Is also women the SVP of Malaysian assets. And for the new energy, the chief for carbon capture and storage, the new technology solution, right, for decarbonizations is also women in Petronas. So one of the program that we have, we call PLWN, uh, Petronas Leading Women Network, right? So it's a conscious intention to one, is to make sure that we embrace and also celebrate the women leaders in Petronas and for them to be the role model 
for others to see. You know, like sometimes we are in Asia, we don't realize that we have these biases, right? We were born with it, and it, because we are very much a patriarchy kind of, uh, you know, uh, it built it with this. Even in, in your family, right? Normally, uh, the, 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 your mother, maybe teacher, or your father is engineers or architect, right? But it, it's built. So we must do something with intention to break that biases. So this is among the program PLWN Petronas does is to really, you know, showcase the women leaders and for them to also mentors and coach other uh, you know, young and upcoming leaders in Petronas so that that chain will continue so that we have that uh, say, sustainable pipeline of talents from women. Oh. And one important thing as well, besides the programs and activities, it must be a top-down approach as well. So one of the KPI, key performance indicator for the senior most leaders in Petronas, the, the VPs and above, they do have DNI KPI. And one of the DNI KPI is the women in leadership position. Thank you. Um, I want to actually touch with a little bit of a social elements before we wrap up on, on, and get a questions from the audience. Um, Dina, we talk about how to, um, we are talking about gender equality here, but that social inclusion is the most important thing in sustainability. Um, what are the, uh, how can we maximize these opportunities um, and also include wider society for this journey? What are the things that are available there? I'll try to be as super concise as possible, given that we have about a few minutes before we wrap up. So someone mentioned that there's this increasing number of countries and companies announcing net zero ambitions. And by some estimate, about 80 to 90% of the world's GDP is already on a net zero trajectory. But what does that mean to the men and women on the street? So I personally see two potential impacts. As we embark on this net zero transition, certain carbon intensive industries and sectors will undergo structural changes. And this potentially can displace many households, especially employees that work in these industries and sectors. So what we need is a robust human capital strategy that enables people to reskill and upskill to take up new jobs in new industries that, that are going to be fast growing. We have seen over the last 10 years, renewable energy cost curves reduce about 80 to 90 percent and today is now cost competitive with fossil fuel. And the renewable energy industry, even in Malaysia, is very vibrant. It employs many people and some of the renewable energy companies are also listed on Bursa Malaysia. So the same sort of changes will take place in the future. So industries that are still in early stages of development like carbon capture and storage, carbon market, nature-based solutions will become critical industries of the future. So that's one potential impact. Another potential impact that I personally also see would be we need to increase adaptation efforts. We need to recognize that climate is changing. Even if we cut down emissions to zero tomorrow, because of the lock-in effects of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which take several years to break down, the planet will still continue to warm. So we need to recognize the fact that climate patterns will become erratic and hard to predict. And this means we need localized, tailored solutions that addresses the needs of the communities. Let me give you two examples. Agriculture small, uh, smallholders and farmers potentially need to change their farming practices to take into account changing drought and rainfall patterns. Communities that are at risk, that live in vulnerable locations, we need to invest in early warning systems that enable them to prepare for changes in the weather. So these are just two examples. So we need localized solutions. So there are two impacts. One is on the labor force. Another would be to increase adaptation efforts. Thank you. Um, we have a, a lot of questions uh, in this uh, through the QR code. Thank you, everyone, to contribute. But because of the uh, interest of time, I'll just select two questions. Uh, one that was very interesting. Um, while government is heavily subsidized oil and gas and fossil fuel, how can we achieve sustainability? <laughs> Ilhan, <laughs> do you want to answer that? The, the question would be more on like, maybe can you repeat that again? Uh, it's about um, subsidizing the energy price. While government is subsidizing fossil fuel yeah. uh, heavily, yeah. and how can we as a society to achieve sustainability? 
Right. So I would argue that um, it is the role of the young generation to be aware of the fact that actually subsidies does not help does not help energy security or uh, addressing the energy trilemma. Right. Uh, market price is necessary um, to ensure more investment are being done, especially in the renewable energy sector. Uh, but again, at the same time, we also have to look into ways or measure uh, because subsidies are still necessary, but for the targeted group, it's not for all. I mean, again, my personal opinion, but as the young generation today, you know, you are talking about future resources, future use of resources, and the definition of sustainability is not the optimized use of resources, not to the ex uh, expense of the future generations. So I think the, the burden <laughs> to push to make sure that this subsidy are much more targeted lies in the current generation today. So I will push it back to whoever asked that question to figure out how to resolve that. Can I just chip in as well, right? I think sure. energy transition, sustainability towards low carbon is a complex topic, right? Uh, especially for a developing country like, like Malaysia. It's, it's not as simple as switching, let's switch from oil and gas hydrocarbons to, to renewable. So I think we are not short of framework and policies, I can tell you, like, but we need to translate that into actions. And, and it's not time to demonize certain sector or certain industry, but we must collaborate like never before. Because some of the new technological solution, which will come for, to, to make us towards you know, uh, net zero, require cross-industry, cross-sector, and inter-ministries collaboration. So that needs to happen more and more. Collaborate like never before, private, public sector, and also NGOs across Malaysia. Great. Dina, there was a question for you. Um, how can carbon offset actually help reducing carbon emission? Yeah, a good question. I was sure there was going to be a question about carbon credit, uh, given that there's a lot of stigma with carbon markets, and rightly so. I mean, carbon markets have existed ever since the Kyoto Protocol back in the late 2000s. Carbon market is still evolving in many sense of the word. There have been instances in the past where companies buy poor quality carbon credits and shift accountability of their own emission footprint. That is why net zero is the going forward commitment where you need to again decarbonize your operational emissions and use carbon offsets again to neutralize hard to abate emissions. The carbon market is still evolving. There are many fundamentals that are still being discussed even at the international level. Uh, there's this movement that looks at how can we do look at core carbon principles basically to ensure the carbon credit standards are rigorous and robust enough that the requirements are clear. So they're looking at issues like additionality, non-leakage, permanence and so forth. So in the future, these standards will ensure that all carbon credit projects go through a very rigorous verification and validation process before they are able to issue carbon credits. So that companies, when they buy these credits, there's assurance that the investments that they are making into carbon credits creates tangible, real life and measurable impact on the atmosphere. So that's one change. The Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative is also ensuring that companies, when they claim they are carbon neutral and net zero, there's a rigorous set of guidelines that they need to follow before they make such claims. So that creates another pathway for companies to make credible offsetting claim and also minimize the risk of greenwashing. Yeah, that was a very concise summary, actually. <laughs> um, great, so, so for, the, for the last round, I'll just promise, because I promised our panelists that we'll give the last comments for the youth. Um, so what would be the last the one thing if you're going to give advice to the, our young professionals? Let's start from Amira. Supposedly, um, starting from the <laughs> generation, but at least for me, as I mentioned before, i really looking forward to see a lot of like female figure in the energy sectors, and especially because uh, in transitional plant, uh, there will be a lot of it. So I'm looking forward to see, and uh, right now, energy sector is not only about STEM, so there will be a lot of like international, we need a lot of like good lawyers in sustainability, good accountants, or even business entrepreneurships as well, startups, everything. So uh, there are a lot of role to play and there is a opportunity for you to actually be the first of everything. Thank you. When, when we talk about sustainability, uh, what comes to mind directly is emissions, green, right? 
and also ESG, people gravitate to the E component, but I think we need to also talk about the S component. Uh, as important as the E component, especially for, for us in, in developing economy. So balancing that E and S, of course governance is given, is fundamental, and all of us have a role to play, regardless where we are, how small, uh, to push the sustainability and ESG agenda forward. Thank you. From my part, we need more females in politics. That's number one. Number two, more talents, um, more young talents to be able to have the point of view, articulate your point of view with regards to the use of energy in Malaysia. Climate change is important, uh, so we need more of you to write or to talk, to debate in this space. Um, yeah, that's all. Be a tough act to follow. But I will try to plagiarize Barack Obama. Uh, so he once said that we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and potentially the last generation that can do something about it. So everyone is invested in this. So I encourage everyone here, the young professionals, to start influencing change and become agents of change for climate action. Cool. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, everyone. That's uh, the end of our panel. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause to our speakers and also our moderator. We would like to invite Mr. Wei Min Jue, the co-director of Youth Economic Forum 2022, to present tokens of appreciation to our speakers. First, we would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Wan Sayuti Wan Husin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I believe that all of us here has gained a lot of insight. And Ms. Amira Bilkis. And to Ms. Ilham Fadila Singh Haji. Also to Mr. Dinagaran Chandra And ladies and gentlemen, our moderator, Ms. Yoram Summer Bay For your information, these gifts are also made aligned with the sustainable, uh, sustainability agenda So all these coasters are made from consumer waste plastics and produced by Beyond Beans committee leaders. All right, let's move to the <laughs> center, the center. stage. All right. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much to our speakers and to Mr. Wei and Miss Bay. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are now on the subject on the agenda of sustainability, we would like to extend a donation offer, as we mentioned before, uh, from each and every one of you in this Youth Economic Forum 2022. So as we have mentioned about carbon emission earlier, to help lower the carbon footprint generated by this event, we would like to offer the Youth Economic Forum Sustainability Pack. So we have chosen, uh, through our collaboration with Malaysian Nature Society, we have chosen coastal protection through mangrove planting to restore and protect Malaysia's coastal ecosystem. So feel free to, um, to scan this code, this QR code, to, if you would like to donate your 50 ringgit commitment fee to support the sustainability action. So as we have mentioned earlier, by signing up for this sustainability pack, you will receive one year of membership with Malaysian Nature Society, help two mangrove samplings to be planted, as well as supporting the community with protective gears and planting equipment. All right, so let's do it together. Um, and we would like to thank you in advance yeah, for your contribution. <laughs> 